Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Um, today's lecture I I called Amazing Limits. Well, it's kind of pretentious name, but anyway, it's a couple of very important limits which uh, which are unexpected, I would say, and uh, they are kind of a symbiosis um, of different parts of mathematics, which which I consider very important. Um, well, this lecture is part of the course um, called Advanced Mathematics for Teenagers and High School Students. It's presented on unizor.com. I suggest you to watch this lecture from this website because it has a very extensive um, explanation for each lecture, like notes, and basically it can be read as a textbook. Plus, registered student, students can take exams, for instance, and there are some other um, benefits. Uh, the site is completely free, by the way. All right, so amazing limits. So we have two limits which I would like to talk about today. Um, both are in some way amazing because uh, personally I didn't expect them to be in such a nice um, mathematically elegant fashion. Um, but anyway, I hope you will join this kind of my amazement with these two uh, limits and I'm going to present it and prove actually that they are true. All right, the number one is, and actually I did mention it before, but I will basically repeat it because it's really about limits right now. Um, limit of sine x divided by x when x goes to 0 is equal to 1. Well, let me just illustrate it graphically. If you have a graph of sine and this is so this is sine of x and this line is y equals x, which is basically angle bisector uh, at 45 degrees. Then, in the immediate neighborhood of zero, when x goes to zero, you see, they are really very much close to each other, so that their ratio is equal to one. So that's what it basically means that the sign in, in the neighborhood of x is equal to zero behaves like, uh, like a straight line, basically. And obviously, I'm talking about x being measured. It's an angle measure, right? So I'm talking about radians. And that's one of the very important, actually, factors why radians actually were introduced. I mean, whenever you measure angle in radians, then this line would be exactly at 45 degrees. The tangential line uh, to the graph of the sine would be at 45 degrees. And it looks good, right? I mean, if x is measured in degrees, for instance, then you have to introduce something like 180 factor, and that's not really nice. This is a very nice, that's why it is one of the amazing limits. All right, so how can we prove it? Well, the way how I will prove it is, um, well, it involves uh, geometry and trigonometry. Um, and that's another reason why the whole thing is amazing, because you see there is a trigonometry, geometry, and function analysis, limits, etc. So it's some kind of a symbiosis of different things together. So let me uh, prove it. And um, basically, x can go to a zero in any fashion. Um, in my proof, I will use the positive x, but uh, it was a negative x is exactly the same thing or mixed, basically. So let me start from the definition of sine. Now, as you remember, trigonometric function of sine is defined on a unit circle, so this is one, 
and this is angle x radians um, it's defined basically as the uh, y coordinate of the point on a unit circle which makes this angle towards this direction of x counter uh, clockwise all right okay so a b basically the length of a b is the value of the sine of x by definition so there's nothing to prove here all right fine so let me do the following so this is c and i will also put a vertical line here perpendicular to the x-axis and I will extend here to D so what do I have? I have that AB is sine of x fine now I also connect A to C now CD what is CD? well think about it you remember that there is also a function called tangent and in a triangle it's opposite catheters towards the adjacent catheters the adjacent is equal to 1 so CD divided by OC which is equal to 1 so it's only CD is basically a tangent so this is tangent of X now, now I will compare three different areas areas of triangle OAC sector OAC sector OAC is basically part of the circle so it's triangle plus this little thing so the circle is bigger than the triangle OAC by uh, this particular by the, by, by the area of this and also so this is a uh, this is a sector and this is triangle OCD now what can I say about areas of these three figures so let's call this A B C now triangle OAC triangle is A it's obviously less than sector OAC because sector has this little thing and the sector OAC in turn is smaller than triangle OCG right so I have this equation now here is an interesting consideration I'm using my drawing basically whenever you are proving something using the drawing you really have to be very careful because sometimes drawing can be done in one way can be done in another way but I hope that um, number one whatever I'm doing here right now can be extended to any other kind of drawing let's say for a negative uh, x or something like this um, that's number one and number two even if might seem to be to some mathematical purist not a hundred percent um uh strong not a hundred percent rigorous um it's still not the purpose of this course to be like a hundred percent rigorous 99 would suffice me and i think that this presentation related to this visual kind of thing to drawing is much better from pedagogical st standpoint so you will understand and you will feel that this is um, kind of a nature n natural um, kind of thing because if I will start manipulating with formulas I will probably get to the same thing but it would not be as visible and as well understood let's put it this way all right so I will use the drawing as it is and from this drawing it is obvious that's what maybe not exactly rigorous word uh, 
it's uh, obvious that the area of triangle OAC less than sector OAC and less than triangle OCG. Now, let's just calculate what are these three areas. Well, okay. A is equal to base is equal to 1 times height AB which is equal to sine divided by 2. So it's 1 half sine x. Now what is the B? Well, if this is an angle of x radians, now the total circle is 2 pi radians, right? So this sector takes x divided by 2 pi part of a circle. And the area of the circle is pi r square, r is equal to 1. So that's my area, so it's x over 2. So b is equal to x over 2. Finally, c, that's area OCG. Well, it's a right triangle. The catheter's OC is equal to 1, and the height is equal to tangent. So I multiply 1 by another and divide it by 2. So it's 1 half tangent x. Well, basically, that's it. I don't need any more the drawing or anything else. Drawing has served its purpose. Now I'm just using this one. One half sine x less than one half x less than one half tangent x. Now tangent x is sine x divided by cosine x, right? Now, I can obviously reduce it or multiply by 2. So, the still I still have this particular equation. Now, what do I do? Um, I think the best way is uh, now, these are all positive numbers because I'm in the first quadrant, right? So let's just, mul uh, let's just invert the whole thing. If this is less than that, inverted would be greater, right? So 1 over sine x would be greater than 1 over x, greater than tangent, with that, which I will put cosine over sine x. Now I will multiply everything by a positive sign, uh, sine x. So I will have this. I will have this. And I will have this, the sign. Now I will have this, this. So I have 1 greater than sine x over x greater than cosine x. Now, now let's remember x goes to 0. When x goes to 0, cosine x goes to 1. There is no... you remember cosine, right? Cosine, again, back to my unit circle for for an angle, cosine is an x coordinate, right? So as angle diminishing to zero, my x coordinate goes to closer and closer to an entire radius, which is one. And on the graph, on a graph, graph of cosine is this, right? So it's 0, obviously, it's 1. So this goes to 1. This is equal to 1. And now re let's recall the squeeze theorem, which I have proven um, in one of these lectures about the limits. Squeeze or the theorem about two policemen and a drunk man. When two bounding um, variables are going to the same uh, number in the limit, then something which is in between 
has absolutely no other way but to go to the same limit. So that was a squeeze theorem or two policemen and a drunk theorem. So that's why this proves that sine x over x goes to 1 whenever x uh, tends to 0. End of proof. So that's it. That's my first amazing limit. My second amazing limit is 1 plus x to the power of 1 over x limit as x goes to 0 equals e. Now, I have introduced again in this uh, function limit chapter of this course what is number e. Number e, um, I will define the definition of number e right now. Uh, because I will be using this to prove this particular thing. I mean, obviously, if I want to, to prove that this goes to E, I have to specify what exactly E is. All right, so how did I define the E? Let me, re let, let, let me remind you this. Um, if you have a function y is equal to a to the power of x, I have proven that with a is equal to 2, the tangential, ten, tangential line would be at angle less than 45 degrees to the x axis. And with a is equal to 3, it will be uh, much, much steeper. It will be uh, the angle of tangential line would be greater than 45. So somewhere in between, between 2 and 3, there is a number which can be used as a base when the line will be at 45 degrees exactly. And that's exactly how I defined the number E. So let me just re redraw this. So first let me put a tangential line at 45 degrees. And now this is how my y is equal to e to the power of x goes and this is one so tangential line at one is uh, now uh, um, it's basically parallel to it's parallel to y is equal to x right now that's how e was defined um, now speaking about tangential line uh, I really have to define it better and again I did it when I introduced all this stuff we can now basically express um, uh, the functional definition of the tangential line here is how if we are talking about tangential line at at some point let's say here point x is equal to r. Now tangential line can be defined as following. Let's just step, let's say forward from r. We will put something like r plus d. Alright? And connect these together, these points. Now what is the tangent of the tangential line. That's increment of the function, which is f of uh, r plus d minus f at r. So this is increment of the function divided by increment of the argument divided by this. Now, I will do the limit as d goes to 0, which means I'm, a pro, um, I, I, I'm make, making this point closer and closer. So my chord will be uh, s closer and closer to a tangential line, which has only one um, common point with, with the curve. 
So now I have two points, but when these two points are closing to each other, I will have only one. So this is basically the tangent of the tangential line at point x is equal to r. Now let's go back to my uh, exponential function with the base e. So let's step from uh, 0. We are talking about tangential line at point 0. So let's step forward to a, po to, to a point x. Now this is the chord. Tangential line will be e to the power of x minus e to the power of 0, right? Divided by the increment of the argument. So this is increment of the function, this is increment of the argument. So tangential, tangential, tangent of the chord will be this. Now if I will do the limit of this as x goes to 0, my x point is getting closer and closer then my chord will be closer and closer to a tangential line. And the limit of this is actually the tangent of tangential line. And I'm saying that this is equal to 1. Right? Because the tangent of this uh, line at 45 degree is 1. It's parallel to this one. Increment of function is equal to increment of the uh, argument. So this is basically a defining characteristic property of E. I, have, I actually should consider this as given. So this is given, and this is what I have to prove. Okay, this is a completely different um, language right now. Now, I really know what E is in this particular thing. And I know that E is a number which satisfies this. And this is given. All right, fine. Now let me present this graphically. By the way, e to the power of 0 is 1, obviously, right? Because any number to the power of 0 is 1. So that's what I have as given. Now, again, I will approach this graphically, which, again, some purists might consider not 100% rigorous, but I think it's very... Um, uh, very nicely explains actually the meaning of this relative to this. Okay, so here is my graph. Now, if step um, this e to the e to the power of x is here, right? But I'm subtracting one from it, which means I'm shifting it down, and now. It will be down to the minus 1, the left part of it, and then it will be something like this. That's my e to the power of x minus 1 graph, and this, so this is e to the power of x minus 1, this is x, y is equal to x. And, not that my drawing is perfect, let me just make it slightly better. So it seems to be more like a tangential line. Okay. All right. So this is how it looks. This particular thing is the ratio between this and this. And if you remember, we just talked about sine. When the sine and x are very close to each other, this is exactly the same type of closeness. Now, let's analyze this particular thing. How can I slightly change maybe 1 plus x to the power of 1x uh, mm, tends to e? Now, um, if something tends to something else and I apply the same function to both of them, and I'm talking about function called logarithm, um, then the result will be also um, that the value of the function of this will be uh, approaching the value of the same function of this. So what I'm talking about is 
logarithm at 1 plus x to the power of 1x would, uh, will, will tend to logarithm of e. Now, ln is natural logarithm It's logarithm at base e. Logarithm can be at any base, right? So I choose the same number e as the base of this logarithm. Why? For a very simple reason. Because logarithm of e is 1. Because what is the power I have to raise e to get e? 1. So this is 1. Now, logarithm of something in the power of something else you know there is a property of logarithms logarithm of a to the power of b is equal to b logarithm a doesn't matter what kind of a base it can be 2 can be 3 can be e can be anything so instead of this I can put this 1x should be here outside of logarithm so this is what I have to prove right now let's see about two things well let me just put it down as a denominator So this is what I have given, basically. And this is something which I have to prove. And they are very close to each other. Look, I mean, they're, they're, they look very, very much alike. Now, let's compare logarithm of 1 plus x and e to the power of x minus 1. These are two different functions, right? Now, let's resolve this function as x from y. It will be what? 1 plus y is equal to e to the power of x and x is equal to natural logarithm of 1 plus e. Power, which I have to raise e to get this, right? That's what it is. And look at this. Uh, plus x, sorry. Plus x. No, y. I'm talking about reverse function, y. So x in terms of y. So that's what it is. Now, what does it mean? If this function looks exactly like this, which is a result of the x resolving as y, this is inverse function. So this logarithm of 1 plus x is inverse to e to the power of x minus 1. And you remember that inverse function you remember what inverse is, right? So to speak. Or f of g of x is equal to x. If we apply, for instance, x square and square root of x. Or, in this case, e to the power of x minus 1 and then logarithm of 1 plus x. If we apply these two functions in a row, we will get x again. So that's what inverse function is. And uh, with inverse functions, if you remember, uh, and if you don't, you can actually refer to corresponding algebra uh, lecture, which, which is in the course. They have graphs symmetrical relative to um, bisector of the uh, main angle on the coordinates. So what I'm saying is that the graph of uh, this function should be symmetrical to the graph of this function e to the power of x minus 1 relative to this and it will look like this obviously that's what my symmetry is right and it would be some kind of line where it go where it goes to now not only graphs of the functions will be symmetrical relative to this, but also tangential line to this, 
will also be symmetrical to corresponding tangential line. So let's talk about point zero. Point zero in this symmetry relative to this bisector, angle bisector, reflects to itself. Now tangential line, as we know, for this function is the bisector, right? Now bisector reflected to bisector again will reflect into itself. So what happens is that this point in this reflection stays and the tangential line also stays and this tangential line would be tangential in exactly the same way to this one. So this is basically the, 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 the basis, so to speak, for, for the proof which, which, I, which, which I am suggesting right now. Since my tangential mechanism remains in place, the same line which is dividing my angle in two halves, two equal halves, is tangent to this and tangent to that, then there is absolutely no difference in the result of this limit. So, basically, I'm considering that I have, from this as given, I can say that in exactly the same fashion, this is given as well. Where I replace my e to the power of x minus 1 with inverse function, um, and, and I did it because they are completely symmetrical and the tangential line to one of them is reflecting to a corresponding tangential line into another but they are the same since they are coinciding with the axis of symmetry. So now, since this is proven, how can I go back to this? Well, easily. First of all, if I know that 1x logarithm of 1 plus x tends to 1. Now I can put back logarithm inside to the power of 1x. That's the same thing. It also goes to 1. Now if this goes to 1, then if I will use exponent e to the power, I will get e to the power of left part and e to the power of the limit. e to the power of logarithm, uh, which is natural logarithm with a base e, would be 1 plus x to the power of 1x, 1x, and the limit will be e to the power of 1, which is e. So I have this. <coughs> Again, if we will excuse my usage of the graph and inverse function, etc., uh, as maybe only 99% rigorous, um, then it's pretty good explanation of why this thing is really happening. And I think it's much better kind of approach which gives you really very visual representation of why this is actually true. Um, uh, so I think this is actually a, kind of a better approach to uh, to give you the feeling of why this thing is happening. Not only this is that this thing is happening, which we can probably prove by some chain of formulas one after another, but this actually shows you what's behind it. Because most likely, the real mathematician first find this type of um, laws uh, using some intuitive methodology. And whatever I was showing is basically just an expansion of intuitive uh, understanding of this. And only then, if they really want to, they, they can approach it in a very, very uh, strict and uh, rigorous fashion with formulas, etc., etc. So, I would like to stop here. I'm not going any, to any more details about these type of things. The only little consequence of this is which uh, I probably mentioned in one of my lectures before if you will take 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n where n is just a natural number obviously it goes to 
e as well. Because if n goes to infinity, 1 over n goes to 0. So if x is equal to 1 over n, then n is equal to 1 over x, right? So it goes exactly into this formula. So limit as n goes to infinity is the same as this, where x is going to 0 with this substitution. And this is actually a very interesting thing. I mean, you probably have heard about this, that 1 plus 1 nth to the nth power goes to some strange number e. And by the way, this can be another definition of e. So we can actually use this limit or this limit, whatever, as a definition of e and then derive the other thing, like e to the power of x minus 1 divided by x goes to 1. So it's basically all these equivalent uh, definitions of E can be replaced one with another using one as a definition and another is supposed to be proven or the other way around. Okay, that's it for today. Um, thank you very much and uh, I suggest you to read the notes for this particular lecture just to refresh your um, memory and, uh, and maybe better understand it. Other than that, you got it. Thanks and good luck.